I was just going to ask, if, is it about acknowledging heritage of manufacturing in England and Britain as well? And is it about acknowledging you made that small part and that made the big engine and that's part of a, uh, making, them, making people understand that actually every little contribution of every part makes a bigger picture and makes a bigger industry? Um, so I suppose my point was that is in that's quite a museum as, attitude, mm -hmm. you know, an, angle to have. So I think it does have to go hand in hand with with manufacturing, and it, the whole point is is it to the programs will encourage those people to think that they might have a future in the development of a manufacturing process. It's a luxury to go tinkering around in a, in in that kind of setting. It's a if you have to go out and work at sixteen in a factory. I don't know if that's. Okay, I'll, I'll try and answer that one. So I think it's about pride in your place. So if you're proud and you understand what's being made in, in that environment, in that context, then you begin to raise aspiration because people then can aspire because they understand the identity of their city. Um, so I think that's a lot to do with it and, and actually understanding you know, where your dad works or where your mum works and what she actually does and understanding that's part of you and your... Um, you know, and the identity of where you're growing up. Um, so I would say, yeah, that's definitely part of it. Um, it's also providing a window to manufacturing. So we talked about perceptions before. Um, you know, employers want um, to recruit people who, well, young people who have the skills um, in, their, in their industry, but young people don't know they exist because they are on industrial estates or whatever, so they don't know what manufacturing industries exist in a city because they're closed off worlds. So what we've been trying to do is work with um, factories to try and give a window to those worlds by providing um, tours uh, for young people to go and have a look around with um, their peers, so they often... Uh, young apprentices will often take them around and show them what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis and kind of inspire them to, you know, you could work in, a, in, in this industry. Um, there are opportunities here for you. This is what it involves because you can't expect young people to know what opportunities are out, are out there for them. So I think it's, it's both those, those angles. So does it have more of a role in keeping manufacturing in this nation? rather than just creating your own artworks and solving your own problems and being retired and tinkering around and having a nice time? Is it about keeping manufacturing in this country? It's it, it's, yeah, it, <laughs> it is. And I think it's also about aligning with where manufacturing is moving and what, how we can compete as manufacturing in this country. Because as I mentioned before, you know, we can no longer compete with mass manufacture of things because we can't do it as cheaply as other nations. But what we've always been, as, as a, I mean, Come on, we said we're a nation of we're a nation of tinkerers. Um, we've always been good at innovation, invention, and design um, through product and, and, and technology. And I think that's a heritage that continues. Um, and I think if we can expose young people to the future manufacturing skills, the future development skills, and the future design skills, that's important to keep that high-level, high-value design and manufacturing in this country. Yeah. Daniel. I think it's, uh, slight, if I can kind of rephrase what you're suggesting to not keep manufacturing, but keep being part of manufacturing. Because digital fabrication allows from a single thing to a small batch to a bigger batch, understanding, um, responding to clients' needs through batch production uh, or multiple batch and customization, if we don't build that knowledge, then we really won't be part of uh, the future of manufacturing. The other aspect of it is that there is a, a, a heritage of craft, quality, invention that is very UK, uh, very British, and it's different from craft, for instance, say, in Japan, which has maybe a, a, a other, other relationships with materiality and different types of heritage also with quality, but maybe less with uh, the type of invention that uh, exists here, or tinkering. Or so that means that uh, very high quality things still get made, designed and made um, in places other than China, or now uh, soon Africa, or wherever the Chinese are now going to produce. 
But um, the thing is that uh, a lot of the machines that are used, you know, the, the, the actual precision bits are made in the UK. Um, so, and the, the quality then is set by these, the knowledge of manufacturing at the so kind of uh, top of the stream manufacturing. And that's the bits that I think we need to be part of. And I, I'm not sure if it's Lancashire or UK or British or Europe or West or China or the world, but we need to be part of it. And the way to be part of it is for people to have those stepping stones from leisure making to understand that that is connected to manufacturing, that's connected to uh, economics, that's connected to life quality. And so these conversations of how making is part of your quality of life, um, I think have to be part of it. Yeah. And one of the things I think we need to be acutely aware of is the pressures that are facing manufacturing now. And although there's a lot of rhetoric around Empire 2.0 and how we're going to bring back all of the jobs, the nature of manufacturing itself is changing and there is a kind of global imperative to recalibrate how and where we make things. And that won't necessarily... That isn't a conversation we should just have as regions or as a nation about the things we are good at. That's a conversation that's a global conversation because there are some ways we currently make and produce and the ways we distribute the things we make and produce that are frankly insane. They're incredibly high consequence and they've been incentivized through economic and social and political means to be that way. So there's a whole scale recalibration of the system that needs to happen if we're going to change how and where we make things. So I see maker spaces as one aspect of something in that because it changes the literacies, it changes what people think is possible and that changes their design decision making as they go forward because it gives people smaller scale spaces to try and find out the consequences of how they're making things in a way that's safe and that's trusted so that then when they are the multinational corporation CEO, they can make good design decisions and they can understand the material consequences of the things that they're commissioning and what they're enabling. Do we have any other questions? I don't like that. Daniel, you will have a question. Do I have a question? Oh, probably. Who knows any teachers that would be interested to be <laughs> part of Fix Trips? Thank yeah, you. We do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I've got a question. Um, it's, I think it's been discussed before, um, definitely this week, but a bit earlier today as well. And it's, it's around this perception of the maker movement still being it's about perception and it's, it's about that being seen as a one a, a, a movement that's about social impacts and, and about some, some social change, which clearly that's coming through and that's clearly something that's needed. But how do we maintain that um, when we become more integral to things like industry and industrial paradigms? Are, are, are there going to be forces and factors that are going to naturally compete with us or prevent what this could be? I think one, one of the issues we did see, I mean, the thing about the, the, what we kind of call the maker movement, it's quite subversive movement. It, it, it's, it's not been created by any kind of organization or any kind of um, government. It, it, it grew from the ground up. And one of the things that I know Biz tried to do a few years ago was, was see how they could support. They, they gathered a lot of makers around the table and they said, how, how can we help move this movement forward? And kind of the main, the main advice they got was, well, keep a step back, basically, because I think when you try and create, you know, I, I've always wanted to call it something that became the maker movement. Everyone wants to kind of collab, you know, put it into a pigeonhole, so it was this or it was that. And one of the things that Biz tried to do was say, okay, how do we define what a maker space is? And, and people who are in maker space were like, well, do we really care? Um, because they were doing it because they wanted to do it, not because it was being defined or it was being a pigeonhole. And I think that's one of the things is we've got to be careful that this is an organic movement, and if we try and say, okay, where are we going to take it next, and where are we going to move it, and how can we help it? I think the best thing to do is let, let it grow and, let it, and leave it alone. 
there's definitely a risk there, isn't there? There's the there's evidence-based policy making, and then there's policy-based evidence making. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. So there's definitely a kind of there's a responsibility in how we articulate what impacts it is capable of, uh, how, we are how we frame the things we're seeing, but also in what, recognizing what's countable and recognizing mm. what sort of impacts are not countable. Is that something that, uh, Andreas, to you really? I mean, because there's, there's natural synergies with, um, with this part of the world and your, and the part of the world where, where, where you're based. And when you embarked on your journey, your, you know, your, your, your narrative there, I mean, was that something that you had to reconcile or consider? Or? As part of the, I guess what I didn't say at the end of my presentation was as part of the um, project, what we're actually doing is um, we're conducting a social return on investment study. So we're seeing whether or not um, this project and the people who are involved in it, um, whether it has not just a financial and economic impact for the city, but whether it has a social and environmental impact as well. Um, so that's something that we've commissioned um, to happen. And there's a, there's a post actually in the HLF bid, which is, is seeking that information to try and um, understand, I guess, how we how we evaluate some of that through that social return on investment model. Um, so, it, so it basically um, gives a financial uh, proxy value to um, uh, things that people value, so things that the stakeholders value. And we've been doing a bit of work with um, people to understand what those are. So we did a, a, what ma a measuring what matters day. So we asked people what mattered to them in their community um, so that we've got a, a, a baseline for that. Um, it's quite an interesting model, um, but it's something that we really wanted to do and actually prove rather than just in financial terms that it does have a, hopefully has a social and, and um, environmental um, impact as well. Brilliant. Um, I think there's one more question. And then we have three Hi, minutes. Um, my name's Caroline and I'm from the Harris Museum and Art Gallery in Preston. So we're another museum um, library and art gallery and we have a maker space um, we've had one for about uh, almost a year and I know you've been talking about the hype and impact of maker spaces and ours is pretty sort of tentative compared to having been to fab labs today where like a not a fraction on you but we have a 3d printer we do coding we do dressmaking knitting you and I found and I think the impact for us I mean, we're quite removed from industry um, and from manufacturing and things like that, but the social impacts for, and the way that we work at the museum, it's quite different, and the makerspace has driven that. So we work, we do different sorts of workshops, we're working with different users, the way that we plan things is starting to change, and I think the makerspace has been a big driver for that. So there are impacts perhaps where you don't expect to find them, and I think that's for us at the Harris, and, and it's driving, and hopefully it will drive more change for us as time goes on. So that was just my contribution. That's perfect. I think we should count that as the wrap-up. Thank you. <laughs>